Okay, we're good. Yep, we're good. Okay, great. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Broadband Breakfast Live Online for Wednesday, August 2nd, 2023. I'm the host this week, Ahmed Hathout. I'm the managing editor of Broadband Breakfast. Uh, Drew is out somewhere at a conference. Uh, this is probably one of the only weeks I'll do this, but um, we are going to discuss a actually very important topic. It's actually kind of sliding under the radar uh, in the shadow of bead, um, but it's a very, very important one. Um, but before we get into that, I got some housekeeping stuff to get through. Um, so we do this every week, every Wednesday at noon. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows that uh, if you're new, well, there's the news. Um, so next week, um, we are up here. We are live from Mountain Connect next week, um, so stay tuned for that. I also have a preview of our BEAT Implementation Summit, which is on the 21st of September. Um, so that is obviously regarding the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program of the NTIA. Um, that is now in the state's hands as they've had their money allocated. Um, so we have all of this information on our website. We are... Um, a news publication, we do events, we are doing this regular, bigger conference um, thing. Uh, so the next one, again, is the Beat Implementation Summit in Washington on September 21st, 2023. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, just give an introduction as to what we will be discussing today, and then I'll get into the panelists, and then we're going to give them an introductory two and a half minutes of introductions as to what they want to say about the issue, and then we'll get into questions. And then we'll have uh, the crowd kind of, or, or rather the audience, give some questions if they wish. Um, so just an intro to the issue. Back in 2020, Congress passed the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. Uh, that act created the Secure and Trusted Communications Network reimbursement program, otherwise known as the rip and replace, that is under the guise of the FCC. The, the program reimburses smaller communications providers that remove, replace, and dispose of insecure equipment, namely from Chinese firms Huawei and ZTE. There are somewhere in the ballpark of about 24,000 pieces of this risky equipment that needs to be removed. There is bipartisan agreement in Washington that China is a threat, and so there is alignment on getting rid of equipment from America's communications networks. There's just one problem. There's apparently not enough money. Uh, so the FCC was given $1.9 billion, excuse me, uh, but the FCC and industry have said that there is a $3 billion shortfall that needs to be addressed. And we're going to get into that aspect of it. We're going to get into you know, about the timeline of giving the funds, we're going to get into some of the undercurrents, that is potentially inflation, supply chain, all of that stuff. So I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel. I mean, we couldn't ask for a better panel. These these people know what they're talking about. They're on the ground. They they have they have their ears to the providers. So they're going to give us an update, hopefully, on, on what's going on. So let's start with Carrie Bennett. Um, Having launched several startups, including her own successful boutique communications and technology law firm prior to joining Womble Bond Dickinson, uh, Carrie uses her entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit to make the seemingly impossible achievable. Carrie is exacting and persistent in achieving her clients' goals. She is known as a spunky, outspoken advocate for small rural carriers, having battled with regulators and large companies for more than 30 years to ensure that small rural businesses have a seat at the table and a strong voice in Washington, D.C. And of course, we have Tim Donovan. He is the president and CEO of the Competitive Carriers Association, the nation's leading association for competitive wireless providers and stakeholders across the United States. CCA's members range from small rural carriers serving fewer than 5,000 customers to regional and national providers serving millions of customers, as well as vendors and suppliers that provide products and services throughout the wireless communications ecosystem. As the highest ranking executive, Tim leads association advocacy and operations with government entities, press, membership, and the general public. 
And of course, last but definitely not least, Arman Musi is president and founder of Summit Ridge Group. He has over 15 years of equity research, investment banking, and consulting experience. Armand has completed dozens of financial valuation, strategic analysis, business development, corporate governance, and business plan creation assignments in the communications industry, and has experience working on numerous financing and mergers and acquisitions transactions. His projects include leading Summit Ridge Group's support of the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division's review of the proposed T-Mobile and Sprint merger, of course, that closed in 2020. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's start with Kerry. Uh, if you want to give just about two and a half minutes of what your thoughts are on this issue that we're going to discuss today, and then we're going to move um, to Tim and then Armand. Right. So in addition to being a partner at Womble Bond Dickens, I just wanted to add one of my clients is the Rural Wireless Association. I'm their general counsel as well. So our members have been very, um, 25% of our members have been in fact impacted by this issue. And I just want to go back and, and set a little history here because this all came about through a reverse auction took, that took place in the mobility fund phase one process back in 2009, 2010 time period where the FCC was looking for the lowest cost provider to come in and build 3G and 4G networks in rural America. So the Chinese government got wind of this. Um, the Chinese government subsidizes Huawei and ZTE. So they were able to have those companies come in and offer low, low pricing. And that's how this got into the network in the first place. Um, so one of the things that I think we need to be cognizant of is that a race to the bottom and reverse auctions is not a good way to build out communications networks in the US. Um, that having been said, Congress recognizes the problem and then tries to solve it by the way we solve a lot of problems. We throw money at it, right, to try to get it out. But Congress didn't throw enough money at this um, in the very beginning because they based it on volunteerism where carriers came forward and said what it would cost them to take out the, the network equipment. But only a certain number of carriers came forward. And then Congress found out and the FCC found out that there were many, many more carriers out there that had never come forward. So the original price tag was set uh, on a small sampling of companies. And now that we have a larger sampling of companies or the full, full I guess, the full Monty of companies coming into this, the price tag went up. Um, so we have small companies that are struggling with only 40% of the um, costs being available to them and being able to do the job that they need to do and replace these networks. Um, the other issue that I just want to tag, and we can talk about this later, is the fact that we're frozen at 4G when we're in a 5G world. And one of the things that Congress could look at is they start looking at funding and getting this money more available to these carriers to do the job, at least in the wireless part of it, because there's also fiber that has to be ripped out that has nothing to do with wireless, but to allow 5G to be paid for as long as the cost doesn't go up. So as long as they're frozen at the number that they were given as the, the, the nut, why not let them build 5G more secure networks? Because that's all uh, what this is about is national security. And at the rate we're going, I wonder whether this is really about national security because there doesn't seem to be a real push to get this done. Um, and we can talk about all the problems that the FCC is having with the program and the reimbursement program um, administrator as well. And I'm sure we'll, I'm sure Armand's really going to want to get into that one <laughs> because there's a lot of delay with the program and in addition to the cost of funding the program. So I'll stop there because I think I just teed up about 30 issues. <laughs> Tim, you want to jump in and go ahead? Sure, happy to. Um, so I'm Tim Donovan, President and CEO of, of Competitive Carriers Association. Um, thank you, Brub and Breakfast, for highlighting this issue at a really important time. Um, and happy National Ice Cream Sandwich Day to everybody out there. Um, glad that some of you were able to, to join us on, on this holiday. But um, on a serious note, uh, so CCA represents competitive wireless carriers. Uh, most CCA carriers do not have this problem, but for the CCA members that do, um, this is an outside impact on, on all of their operations. Um, you can't look about future planning until you can get out of the, the current situation and complete the rip, replace uh, and destruction of it. And uh, the, the short story is that it's not going well right now. And a, a big part of that is, is the need of Congress to, to finish the job here. It's been 1,238 days since Secure and Trusted was signed into law. In that time, we've had six different iPhone release dates We've had two different Fast and Furious movies, but we still do not have full funding uh, to complete this program. And as, as Carrie mentioned, the, the companies are stuck right now, um, frozen in time from where they were uh, when the when Secure and Trusted was enacted. 
and really seeking more than anything to be on the other side and complete so that they can go back to managing their business and, and trying to serve their, their subscribers and, and expand their networks as best as they can. Um, I know we've got a whole bunch of, of issues to delve into, so I'll, I'll leave it there as we go into some of the discussion, but really uh, appreciate highlighting the, the importance of this issue as uh, we're at a really critical time and, and every participant in the applicant is, is on the clock now with less than a year to complete the removal, replacement, and destruction of this covered equipment uh, with you know, less, less than 40 cents on the dollar. Um, so we really need action and leadership from Congress. We appreciate the some really strong bipartisan support so far um, and look forward to talking about some more of these issues. Armand. Uh, thank you. As uh, I mentioned, I'm president of Summit Ridge Group. One of the uh, projects that we work on is that we represent a number of the participants in Rip and Replace in securing them uh, reimbursement funding. In fact, we've our clients represent 43.2% according to our calculations of the uh, total amount that's been reimbursed to date. Uh, so the big focus of this call is uh, primarily on the lack of money, the um, $3 billion shortfall, and that is a significant issue, and particularly as companies are running into uh, using up their 40%. You know, those who got started early, who really treated this like a national security issue, who uh, showed the motivation to get started early are now running out of money and are forced to renegotiate with their vendors, uh, potentially stop their programs and then restart, which only is going to drive up costs further. Um, it's really inefficient, and it's actually penalizing those who actually were most uh, aggressive at doing what the FCC wanted, which is trying to get rid of this equipment uh, fast. Also, from the vendor's perspective, uh, they also don't know how long this is going to go, if there is more money or not. So we just saw, I think yesterday or two days ago, Ericsson laid off 750 people, and that is primarily the internal staff that they had working on sites, and they're moving all of that to using contractors. And of course, if you're trying to do a complex project fast and you're using uh, contractors as opposed to your own employees, you, you know, don't always get uh, the best work. But I'd also like to highlight another issue, and that is the reimbursement process has been rather um, problematic for two reasons. One is that it's, it's understaffed. And before actually I say anything further, I want to make it clear that I'm, this is Summit Ridge Groups and in my personal opinion and not those of any of our uh, clients. The process has been understaffed. Um, what used to take a couple of days in terms of uh, processing a small modification to an application uh, now takes weeks. Uh, the process is also overregulated. So for example, uh, if you have a, an estimate for a cost, then the actual cost comes in and it's always gonna be slightly different. You can't just submit the uh, invoice. You have to actually go into the, to the system, modify the application, to change the cost in the application to exactly match the invoice. And again, sometimes that used to take a day uh, to process at the FCC. Now that's taking weeks. And then you submit your invoice, which uh, is usually taking weeks, uh, sometimes even weeks before they'll start looking at it, and then weeks uh, following that. Uh, additionally, communication is not great. We found many instances where we're waiting uh, on something to be processed. And finally, we uh, reach out to them. And they say, oh, we thought we sent you an email three weeks ago. Turns out they forgot to. Uh, things like that are coming up. And we think that might be because you know, much of the staff that they're using is uh, part-time and working remotely and have never met each other. And that's led to very inconsistent uh, reviews where one person reviewing it will say, this is fine. You submit the identical thing a week later and they'll say, you know, it's not fine. We want some more information. And so uh, as a result, if you look at the FCC's last um, statement on rip and replace uh, about, I estimate that it's gonna take them at this rate, six and a half years to uh, refund or to deploy the 1.895 billion that has been allocated and about 17 years to uh, deploy the whole uh, you know, five and a quarter billion assuming that eventually gets funded. And clearly this pace has got to speed up. It's just not consistent with uh, the, um, this being a national security issue. I Thank would just you, add, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add to that. I mean, there's a litany, a litany of so many problems with the pro, with the fund administrator and how they process things. Things I will give some examples can be off by let's say 35 cents and it has to all be redone and resubmitted and it, they are it's in a request for information about it and to the point where our members are coming to me and saying, can we just agree with them if something is off by $100 or less, 
we'll just lose the hundred dollars. They can take the hundred dollars. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars of having to get processed. Let's not nickel and, you know, not even nickel and dime pennies. It's like, the, you know, penny wise, pound foolish. And that is causing so much more work for the carriers who are trying to get reimbursed. And they have specialists like Armand's company and another company called Widelity that are helping them with it. But And those costs are actually reimbursable, the fees that they charge to help them get the invoices processed, which drives up the cost. And it's making the, this the whole administrative process of this is getting super costly, not to even mention the fact that these are, you know, the ones I work with are super small and don't have the resources to spend on this because they're trying to run their, you know, right now trying to deal with two networks, you know, the old network and the, and the new network. And it's just really, really, in, you know, inefficient and ineffective. And so I think that we have to put some rails on this program and the FCC has to give some oversight to the fund administrator and more guidance on what's acceptable, not acceptable. A lot of this is done, you know, I'm a lawyer, so, you know, the administrative law process is not being followed at all. It's like the different applications are being treated differently depending on who the person, the fund administrator is working on them, which raises huge red flags from my perspective on how the process is being handled. And the FCC really needs to get a grip on this and rein some of this in and set some better guidelines for the fund administrator. And I feel like that there's not a lot of oversight from the FCC with the fund administrator unless you go to the FCC directly and tell them the problems. And then that costs legal fees because you usually have a lawyer or a consultant doing that. And then those fees are, they're trying to get reimbursed for those because these are not something that the carriers bargained for. Um, and then there's all these questions about whether legal fees can be paid for. And, and then to Tim's point, because CC is do, doing a great job on the Hill trying to get the additional money, the fund administrator is rejecting costs for the companies to do lobbying to get the additional money that they need to pay for the program. So th there are all of these things that nobody could have anticipated. I think the fund administrator did the same work for the um, broadcast repack program. They're using EY, the same, the same group. This program is so much more complicated than the bro broadcast program, and they're trying to treat it the same way. And they need, they say they've been through a learning curve for the last year. And, you know, and after a year, the learning curve is over, folks. We got to do better. Um, to only get 10% of the money out of the available money out in a year's time, time is ticking. We're, we don't have any indication from the FCC that there's going to be an extension. They're allowed to grant a blanket six month extension to everybody. We're starting to work on extension requests because we already have an October deadline coming up for one of our members that is not going to, they're not going to be able to make it because of the delays that they've experienced with the fund administrator. So, so uh, Carrie's correct. Um, if there's a rounding error of you know, one dollar in a very large invoice, which may have two hundred items on it, you know, or even thirty-five cents. Uh, you know, they make you uh, redo the whole thing and resubmit it. In fact, they don't mind, you know, paying you know ten thousand dollars to try to chase down a thirty-five cent error, uh, rounding issue, even if the client is willing to concede the thirty-five cents. They, in the interest of wa minimizing waste, fraud, and abuse, they'll be happy to spend thousands of dollars to chase down a fraction of a dollar. And, and that's, that's a lot no of waste. A lot of waste is going on on their end, not on our end. On their end. Okay, well, I just want to just a lot of the a lot of the uh, cost estimates were were exactly that were estimates were based on cost catalog. I do think there's room for improving the process where where the actual comes in at less than what was estimated using the average of the cost catalog. That should be green lit, you know, automatically. That shouldn't be seen as a concern. You know, for one example. One of the operators uh, you know, estimated at a site that they were going to need three cabinets on the ground with it. Well, they they needed two when they got there. And, and instead of saying, well, that's great, that's one less cabinet we have to buy, they did get a request for more information asking, well, why did you need two, not three? And well, the answer is we were there. We were on the site and we realized that that's all that we needed. Um, so some of these things, I do think there there is a learning curve. We have been trying to, to work with the commission, with Ernst & Young in the process, um, but as it moves forward, and now that we've we've crossed a deadline where where everyone has submitted at least their first reimbursement, um, we should really look at ways that we can improve the processes and, and have, especially where there's common sense solutions that things because you're basing it off of an estimate or an average, if it's less than that, there should be some presumptions that that, that is mm -hmm. approvable and, and able to move forward. 
the, the system was, uh, and I won't say it was working perfectly, but it was workable in sort of the March, April timeframe when they sort of came up on a learning curve and there weren't too many people applying. Now things have really ground to a halt, uh, not a quite a halt, but uh, to a trickle, just because people are submitting their first uh, invoices and uh, there's certainly the staff has not increased at all. And uh, at the same time that staff is trying to understand each of the applications that are now starting uh, in volume and they're just not staff to handle that. I'm just gonna jump in. Okay, uh, Armand, you, you noted, uh filing for reimbursement. There was, uh, Jessica Rosenrosso wrote in a letter to Congress recently that there was a time, there was a, a deadline coming up that July 15 deadline, that was two weeks ago, about reimbursement. Can you talk a little bit about that and, you know, what is currently going on with that deadline? You know, what has happened? Has there been an extension from the FCC if for any of the members that you've sure. talked to? Can you just add a little bit to that? When the allocations were made uh, July 15th a year ago, this July 15th, July, last July 15th, uh, applicants had up to one year to submit their first invoice, which was July 15th that just happened. Uh, so as we came, the, the fact that all the money wasn't allocated, and many applicants decided they would wait as, as long as possible before submitting their first invoice because you don't want to get started and commit to vendors not knowing how much money is going to be available. And so as we came up on the July uh, 15th um, deadline, all of the applicants who hadn't started uh, began to submit their invoices. So the volume that had reached uh, the FCC and uh, ENY went up enormously. And consequently, the uh, processing time has been delayed uh, significantly uh, since then. Uh, things have really slowed down in the past uh, sort of month or so, two months. And part of that delay of people waiting to submit the invoice is because you know, once you get paid on your first invoice, you only have a year to complete the project. So they were trying to buy themselves more time by holding back on the invoices, thinking if I get one of them paid right away, that triggers my one-year deadline for completion of the project. And this is a project I know CCA and RWA in the very beginning of all of this said, you cannot rip and replace a network of some of the sizes of these networks in a year. You just, it's absolutely impossible. So this kind of bought people two years. Well, two years is absolutely impossible too. And two years without full funding is, is a non-starter. It's an absolute non-starter. So where, where do we go? Who's going to loan people money to do this? Because they're going to have to go out and borrow the money to do it, which is also the cost of borrowing that money is reimbursable. But if Congress would just get off the stick and grant you know, or appropriate the additional funding, it would give everyone such a big sigh of relief to know that they could do it. Doesn't mean all of that money that they appropriate, which is what we've estimated it should be now that we have better numbers, the additional three billion, doesn't mean that it's going to all get spent because at the rate EY is going <laughs> and the way they're they're micromanaging every penny to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse, that should give Congress a huge amount of comfort that this money is not just flying out the door willy-nilly. So, and and I, I thought, I'm hoping that Tim will give us an update on where things stand in, in Congress because it's really super disappointing um, that the members of Congress have not appropriated the funding to do this. Yeah, and on, on that piece, I do think it's important to you to caution though that additional time without money doesn't help either. Um, you know that these companies we've mentioned that they've been stuck and um, it's affecting the business, especially since they haven't been able to upgrade networks. The starting point for the the legacy network with the cover equipment wasn't current. Um, so when you're trying to connect things across cores from different companies and manage a business, um, it's resulting in in more outages than most of these operators have, have ever seen before as they're troubleshooting new problems. And it's it's hitting the point where um, for some of these companies. Every month, they're setting a new record for port outs of customers that they're losing. Um, it's not sustainable to be able to keep moving forward without out the funding. And any business case is going to be based on and can fully dependent on the timing and the extent of the funding that is available. Um, you know, we are really proud that there has been some really strong bipartisan congressional support to get it done, especially with the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House, um, with the Commerce Committee in the Senate. You know, just as we hit that uh, deadline last month and that you mentioned, you know, there was a very strong bipartisan statement from you know, Chair McMorris Rogers uh, with Ranking Member Pallone with the Telecom Subcommittee leadership. Um, you know, 
on a bipartisan basis ex expressing you know that frustration and that the Congress has failed to provide the money so far. You know, there aren't many bipartisan things in Congress right now, and and this is one of them. That you know, last summer going into last September, you know, thirty four senators were all on a letter urging full funding on this. You know, a third of the Senate is fully supporting it. Um, we have hit problems where uh, unrelated to rip and replace that have held up legislation, in particular on a, a spectrum reauthorization bill. And we, we could talk for a whole nother hour about the, the importance of reauthorizing spectrum. Um, that there is congressional will to get it done. So my, my case for, for optimism is that I, I do feel strongly it's a matter of, of when, not if, that Congress is going to provide that funding. Uh, the, the challenge is how much damage is done to these carriers in the meantime to make sure that they're still around and able to continue business uh, once that funding is online. So uh, long way of saying that you know, time and extension right now, if it takes pressure off of Congress to act and it's time without money, that that's not going to help get this project to a successful place. Let's, 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 sorry. No, Go, no, I, would... I mean, I, I, so... Go ahead. I, you know, okay. I was just gonna. I was just gonna jump into the to the lack of money part because there's a time period where you know money sits, and then we have the issue of inflation, and then people are complaining about the supply chain problem. So we've heard from SI Wireless, they sent they they discussed something I reported on to the FCC saying basically that they're not seeing money, and they need to see money. So I'm kind of wondering whether you guys can touch on the I guess undercurrents of you know, external, maybe inflation problems, what that does for purchasing equipment, what uh, the supply chain issues, if any, uh, that you've seen from this. These applications were written, what, two years ago? And sort of the estimates that people got were, if they got estimates from suppliers were done a year before that. And that's, I think, when the cost catalog was written. So we've had a good three years of inflation. And obviously that's 15 17% inflation in that time. Right, then you have the supply chain issues, which have artificially driven prices up. And we've had a very tight labor market, uh, particularly in some of these rural markets. We are suddenly asking um, for a large numbers of crews you know, in excess of the, of the normal demand. And that's pushed up uh, prices as well. And so there's an argument that the additional funding should be more than the 3 billion or it should be there should be some allowances for people to um, revisit their assumptions that were made a couple of years ago. And the longer that draws, draws out, the more important I think that becomes. And even bigger picture supply chain, if you only have a certain percentage of the funding, you can't work with a vendor and say, oh, well, I'll take you know 30% of the network now and then I'll get back in line and I'll be ready for you to deliver it again. That's, that's not how network planning works. And that's what's so problematic of, of getting past this initial uh, reimbursement submission deadline without full funding is that now you're trying to execute a business plan um, without being able to have full confidence right now that you can order all the equipment that you need for it, that you're going to be able to have, as Arma mentioned, the crews. And, and the, the problem with that is then you, if you have to operate with the funds available, you start to look at, well, what, what sites are a rip and not replace site? Where am I shutting down service? And then from there, the problem, it really spirals where to rip and not replace, if you're not going to be maintaining that site, you're disconnecting the backhaul, you're potentially taking down the steel. So your rip gets more expensive, meaning you have even less money for a replace in other parts of the network. So it's even more parts of the network that are going dark. And I think it's really important to, to make sure that part of the story is that this is not only affecting the retail subscribers from small carriers in rural America. This affects everybody who's traveling through these networks in these areas. Most of them are built in places where there's no other carrier that provides service. You know, as, as an example, at a, a, a polling of just five of CCA's members that are participating in the proceeding, that altogether they have about 200,000 retail subscribers. Well, in a year, they, they serve 60 million unique roamers on that network. Those are people that are traveling, that are needing connectivity, that Hopefully they don't, but if you need to call 911, you're going to you're going to be thankful that that network's in place. And if that network goes dark, it does not just go dark for the subscribers that that company serves. It goes dark for for everyone. The reason why Universal Service Fund was used to build out these networks is to provide that universal connectivity for all Americans. And so though the loss is not going to be only on those small carriers, it's going to affect everybody as people travel across the nation, especially in those areas where there's nobody else that provides service. 
And I was just going to add to that. It's we are already seeing it. We're already seeing the, the you know, the cell sites are not being rebuilt. Um, the towers are staying up in hopes of the money coming, but you have to prioritize the cell sites. So you have to look at the cell sites that serve locally and the roamers, which ones are going to be the ones that, you know, are more important than the other ones. And you just have to let you know, the other ones go. Um, but you know, what happens when, you know, we get to the point where the year is up and we don't get, you know, if we haven't gotten the funding to do it and you don't have the time to do it because the time has run out, then you can't go and build out to those cell sites and replace them. Um, you can, you can rip them because that's an absolute requirement to have everything ripped and destroyed, but you're not going to be able to replace them. And that hurts all Americans. And it's not just the people, Tim nailed it on the head. It's, you know, the other rumors, there are many things, IOT things out there that are in these networks, precision ag, other things that are, you know, making sure our food supply is safe and that we are able to grow our food supply sufficiently. So we're, we're really harming ourselves. And if somebody doesn't like wake up and see that, and I hope everyone watches this and, um, on the Hill and gets action when they get back from recess, we need it now and we can't wait any longer. And there's several vehicles that I think Tim talked about as pathways forward to doing this. And we don't care which one it is. And I think there's some infighting among members of Congress on which vehicle it should be. And then they're not supporting one another. They all agree Thanks. it needs to be done, but come on, get on, get on one, one step. We could have done this through the NDAA very easily. Deb Fisher had a really, and, and Senator Hickenlooper had a really good bill that she added into the NDA, but it couldn't get brought forward because Commerce Committee wasn't going to support it. So what's, great. I'm just going to call that one out, Tim. <laughs> great, great transition. Great segue, because I was just going to ask. Um, so there are a couple of ideas on the Hill about, I mean, I'm sure you guys don't care what, you know, where the money's coming from, but I want to kind of, maybe you guys can give me a give ideas to, 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 to whoever's watching. So first there's uh, spectrum auction proceeds. They could get money from there. There's a, there's a bill in Congress. And then there's a defend our networks act, which would use about 3% of unused COVID funds toward, you know, topping up the fund thoughts on that. And maybe some ideas for Washington to maybe think about in terms of, you know, maybe immediate or shorter term um, funding. Yeah, I think any path forward that can provide the funding is, is the best path <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> right now. And that's not not to be uh, you know light on it that you know Senator Fisher has been a really strong leader on this in the partnership with Hick and Looper. In fact, they they led that letter with a third of the Senate uh, last summer. There's been support from you know, Senator Lummis, a bunch of other Republicans that oftentimes have been opposed to spending, and say that there are some things that are worth spending money on, and, and national security is something that's worth spending money on. Um, you know, in terms of spectrum was was what we thought was going to get across the goal line in December that would have fully funded it. And that mechanism, I think it's important to mention um, using spectrum auction proceeds uh, would allow, but the would, would cover the fund. But as currently written, uh, as soon as the, the law is enacted, the FCC can borrow the money from the treasury. So that funding is available even before an auction takes place. Um, but spectrum is something that is on Congress's to-do list. Um, Spectrum Auction Authority has never lapsed, and there's growing pressure to get Spectrum Auction Authority back online, especially ahead of the World Radio Conference coming up later this year. Just from a geopolitical standing to support the United States' leadership position. Um, and Chairman Rosenworcel has been, been talking about how uh, there are Spectrum bands that are immediately available to come to the auction of kind of looking at what inventory the FCC has, uh, including Spectrum in the AWS3 band, including in the 600 megahertz band. So there is enough spectrum that we believe to bring in uh, just there already the over the, the three billion uh, that the funding shortfall is right now. Um, so to the extent that spectrum legislation uh, was held up off of disagreements on some other bands, particularly the, the lower three gigahertz band, um, there are other pathways forward using spectrum that could fully fund this uh, in the very near future. I, other important thing to note on the, the spectrum bill, that the Department of Defense has been conducting a study of that lower three gigahertz spectrum band that um, has been uh, a more controversial piece of the spectrum discussion. We're expecting that report before Congress gets back from their August recess. So I'm hoping that that can help uh, move forward with, with a way to uh, have a spectrum bill pass. And, and if a spectrum bill passes, to have it fund the, the shortfall for rip and replace. Um, the other options you mentioned about the Defend Our Networks Act that using unspent COVID funds could, could fund this. 
Um, the National Defense Authorization Act is moving forward. I, I, I do think that one in terms of, of timing is likely more of a later in the year, uh, just the way that there are significant differences between the House and the Senate versions. So that those would need to be reconciled. Um, and then anything that comes up for any additional supplemental spending from Congress, we're going to be looking at that as another way to fund this, because as we're talking about, this is a national security emergency. Um, and so this is something that we need to treat it like an emergency. And when there's emergency spending that comes up, we should fund the, the emergency projects like this that we're facing right now. So you know, just, just um, add, believe, obviously, the detailed congressional analysis to Kim and Kerry, but it's kind of ironic that there's almost no opposition to this and it still won't go through. Um, and it's despite the fact that it's considered a national emergency. And I'm not sure Congress realizes that delaying does not mean you can just add the same amount of money later. Delay costs time. These networks are not designed to be uh, worked on and uh, ripped and replaced in a piecemeal fashion. Um, and then trying to do it in a piecemeal fashion uh, it has impacts for coverage. Uh, and, and sometimes that's emergency services and access to health care and so forth. And then finally, the, uh, the U.S. is spending a lot of um, energy internationally to uh, curtail Huawei and to encourage uh, allies to not use uh, Chinese equipment. But at the same time, it looks a little bit ironic that Congress won't fund replacement of that same equipment domestically. Carrie, do you have anything to add? No, I think they covered it really well. It was just, Great. yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly take a question from the, uh, from, from, the people who are watching, Dan Berkowitz asks, will they be removing any of the infrastructure like imported fiber or messenger strand? And does the new product have to meet Buy America rules? So build America, buy America. You well, if, had, if it had to meet Buy America rules, we'd be in trouble because there's not- <laughs> This program doesn't, have, doesn't follow um, either of the Buy America, Build America, Buy America, or Buy America, Build America rules. So. Yeah, the, the two big providers are Ericsson and Nokia, uh, both of which are international. Uh, it's probably, uh, they're probably working on 90% of the networks. And I'm sorry, on the, fiber, on the fiber part, I was just going to say, I'm assuming he's talking about Huawei components and being replaced. So it's like for like, that's all I can say with respect to that without understanding the detail. If there's equipment that's completely dumb, uh, meaning there's no storage and no processing in it, like a bolt, uh, that can probably stay. I have to look at the exact issues if uh, fiber has no, uh, itself has, if it has no processing in it, but any of the uh, modulators or amplifiers or anything along those lines that would happen to be Huawei or ZTE, uh, those would likely have to be replaced. So Eric Smith actually asks a question that I had in my earlier list of questions, and I, we kind of passed over because I was worried about the time, but I'm going to come back to it. Um, have, has, or have any of the uh, providers that you guys know approached the FCC about extending the deadline? I believe the FCC said earlier that they have a six-month extension under their jurisdiction to push back on the year deadline? It, it, has, there, has there been any requests for extensions? I'm reviewing one right now that's about to get filed. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I think all three of us on this call, uh, our organizations have filed comments with the FCC uh, requesting among other things that the FCC uh, file, uh, provide a blanket uh, six months ex extension. Yeah, I think the next report is due by the carriers. The status report is due August 10th. And I think I will just say to any of the carriers who are participating in the program that um, are filing those reports, you just need to be very detailed about all the problems that you're encountering and encountering when you're listing, um, when you fight when you file that report, and don't hold back. I mean, I think I think we've been trying to be nice and patient, and now it's not the time to be nice and patient about what's going on and the problems that you're encountering and the delays that you're, you're experiencing. Um, and I think that, um, you know, CCA, RWA, others that are out there advocating um, need to rally the membership to go in and talk to the FCC about all of these problems as well. So an individual carrier should be setting up meetings with the FCC. It seems like every time we go into the FCC and talk about it, things break loose. 
I don't think, and that's why I said it in my opening remarks is I don't think the FCC really has a good grasp of how EY is going through this process. Um, and other, or that I'll just say the fund administrator, I'll stop calling it EY, but that's who it is. Um, yeah. I think some people have not filed formally for an extension uh, simply because uh, my understanding is the FCC is working through whether if they provide an industry extension and you ask for a six month extension, whether then the industry extension essentially uses up your six month extension. You know, so if both well, are granted, would you get and 12 I will or remind, you get six? You can, you can, as an individual company, you can ask for repeated six months, six month extensions, mm -hmm. as long as you can justify why you need it. Yeah, we worked closely with, with Congress when the when the law was, was being crafted to make sure that you know the competing pressures of how do you keep up focus with a short deadline while while realizing that for a lot of these operators, they're in the best of circumstances, they were not going to be completing a, a network that they've been building for you know 30 years before it. They're going to completely redo it in one year while keeping customers online. Um so I, the the two types of extensions the FCC can grant is as we were talking about. The FCC can grant an, an industry-wide, you know, all applicants six months extension um, if they see things like supply chain problems. You know, we we argue that the lack of funding is something that is universally facing all of the the applicants in this. Um, but we do again, you know, want to make sure that that doesn't take pressure off of Congress of, of moving the deadline about when we need funding to be provided, um, since that deadline is now. Um, in the rear view that we really need to, to make sure that, that that full funding is coming. And, and part of those discussions we've had with Congress is should there be you know resetting of that one year deadline when the, the additional funds are available, um, in part to let people refocus their, their business plan since they've had to, to act and adjust based off of you know, first submitting their uh, reimbursement plan on what they really think it would take to, to fully rip, replace and destroy the, the covered equipment. Um, they've had to adjust that now with having to move forward and, and act on a business plan with the less than 40% funding. So when we re-up that again, there's going to be necessarily some further adjustments in, in the business plan to move forward um, on, on the timing. Um, and I'd be remiss if we didn't mention that the, the timing is running into uh, a shortened time when you can even access a lot of these sites um, to perform some of the work that uh, we're talking about sites in very remote and frontier areas that are very hard to uh, to get to most of the towers. They they have snow cats and, and uh, cool equipment to get to it in emergency situations, but that's not the equipment you can use for a full rebuild of uh, of the towers. Um, and so things like weather are also going to affect a lot of the industry as the funding continues to lack out, and are going to be further reasons about why additional time is going to be needed, that if you simply cannot get to the tower, um, then you're not going to be able to complete the work and the time frame needed. One, one other thing I will just point out, and Armand, you can let me know if you agree or not on this. I feel I feel like the process that EY is set up, the fund administrator is set up, is almost like it's an audit process on the front end instead of on the back end. And the rules were, the rules allow for audits after this program, you know, when you're done, they can go back and audit you to make sure you didn't do anything you weren't supposed to do or spend money unwisely. So there, and, you, and they can claw back money or hold back money, I guess, to a little bit of a degree, but it feels like an audit up front instead of an audit on the back end. It uh, does feel like an audit on the front end as opposed to on the back end. Um, which seems backwards. Uh, I'm not sure whose fault that is. I'm not sh sure if that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what direction uh, the fund administrator was given on this. So I can't comment, but it was this process for the broadcast repack was not too different other than you didn't have the process of uh, modifications that had to be approved at every step. Um, Donald. But yeah, it is a, it is a Sorry. overly burdensome process if the goal is to, uh, address a national security issue. I, I know John has been asking questions in the chat. I'm just going to get to two others just to close the loop on kind of pressure on the FCC. What, what, uh, so, uh, Loris asks, uh, what are the options to escalate with the FCC, um, about that? Are they, do, do, do providers have any kind of, you know, expedited process or whatever? Like, is there any way they can just like, or is it just a matter of this is, this is locked up with the administrator? No, I think the process is open. Uh, you know, Carrie's been very active in the uh, docket and meeting with the FCC. Uh, Tim's organization has done the same. And to an extent, we have also done that. 
And, and I would just say, you know, I always throw out that, you know, I'm happy to work with Tim and Armand on this, but putting a list of, you know, all the terribles <laughs> that, that, the, that the fund administrator is doing with the RFI process and getting that filed in the docket. So then we can use that to send it to Congress and share that with them and have the, you know, have it be fact-based. Um, and so I would encourage all of the CCA members, RWA members, and anyone else um, you know, involved in this program to share your status reports um, and list everything out and let's get it officially into the record because the status reports, I think they're publicly available, but I think you can redact some of the information. So if you could have a publicly available version of your status report to list everything out, I think that would be really, really helpful so that the FCC can see everything and that we can get some focus on it by members of Congress as well. Yeah. Things, are, things are only going to get worse. I, I hate yeah. to say it, but right now that's that's where we are. Where um, And those are the examples that uh, we've been really engaged, having our members engage with their members of Congress and showing them the concrete examples of here's what's going to happen to wireless coverage in your state with the current state of affairs. That's what really how we've seen some really strong engagement. Um, again, you know, Senator Peters, Senator Lummis, a lot of these members that are really looking at how their networks and their states and their coverage are going to be affected. And you know, I I love how mission driven our members are. But talking with one where they were looking at what sites they were going to have to shut down because of the funding shortfall, and and some of the first ones they were looking at uh, were in places where there was overlapping coverage with another carrier. And they did that because they wanted to make sure that everybody stayed served. But that's not economically sustainable, and that's not going to continue. So we're going to soon have more of the you know bad examples of places that previously had service uh, that no longer do that people. Are, have, have been able to make a 911 call from before that will not be able to do that going forward. Um, and as more uh, of these you know, you know, failures of our, our policy to actually make good on the promise that, that Congress made to these carriers, um, we're going to have more and more reason to escalate. And, and I, that's where I really hope that when, when Congress comes back in September, that this can be a, a top item um, to move forward before, you know, limit the damage to try and keep the networks together as best as we can. It's it is challenging, right? That most of uh, almost all of the uh, applicants in this program you know, do not have a Washington office. Um, you know, we we are their their Washington office. We are working to engage with them. They have you know taken the time and the resources to fly in and meet with their congressional delegations. But it's different than some of the issues that have an, an army of advocates that are are on the ground every day. Um, and so I you know see some talk in the chat, and um, I know John Nettles has led by example on this, but really do encourage everyone to. Make sure that if you're affected by this, to be in constant contact with your representation in DC and make sure that they know it's an issue because this, this is, and, and to connect it all back, that that's how uh, you get progress at the FCC since the FCC really does need uh, action from Congress to be able to move forward and successfully implement this plan. And then the big rub is when you take, try to take those costs and get reimbursed, the reimbursement fund administrator won't reimburse them. They say lobbying isn't reimbursable, says who? It's like we aren't lobbying. If, if but for but for this issue and these pro problems, we wouldn't have to be lobbying. <laughs> and so it's part. It's it just stems directly from the whole rip and replace program. So that's just a silly non-starter. So just add another layer to this. Um, we're aware of a couple of states that have or will be putting in uh, deadlines that are much more aggressive than the federal deadlines. So the carriers in those states, if they don't get rid of their uh, Huawei and ZTE equipment, uh, will not be able to participate in state-based funding, uh, potentially including bead funding. Uh, so then they're in a, really between a rock and a hard place where they need to meet a deadline that's more aggressive than the federal government's and the money is not available. And, and to Harman's point, in many of these cases, these, these are the operators who are best prepared to actually help those, those broadband expansion programs succeed. And instead, they're focusing on how can I just, you know, get back to the current generation of technology so that we can actually start having that discussion about moving forward. Um, you know, they, they shouldn't be penalized for being the, the operator that actually has taken the, the time to invest in their communities here by being barred from participating in some of these programs. We should help them get through this program so that they can take part in the, these other expansions. It would be, you know, a real, real travesty if at a moment when there's such a bipartisan focus and, and more funds that have ever been put towards closing digital divide before to at the same time see towers go dark because of uh, the failure to fund this program. 
we've talked about the horror show, I guess that is what's going on. But I mean, what what about the 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 bright lights? Have have, have you, do you guys know of uh, providers have successfully ripped and replaced using money from the FCC? Well, there's a number of very very small participants who ask for very small amounts of money. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple that uh, just did it, yeah, but I'm thinking, not aware. Yeah, but, several several of our members are near completion and they'll make it within, you know, I, I would say maybe two or three. Um, we'll probably see a couple of extensions just to replace, even though the customer premise equipment isn't replaced, you know, reimbursable, they still have to replace it. So they need more time because you have to you make an appointment with the customer to go on site, install the routers and that sort of thing. So that's, that just takes time. And, and we know of some that will not make it potentially just because it's hard to connect with customers. We've got vacations on people and they want to be home because they have kids at home and they don't want to you know leave the kids alone with a someone, a stranger type of thing. So, yeah, so those, those things just take time. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think we're, I have a couple who are very close um, but they were also in a position where they could wait for the money to come in. They borrowed the money from a sister company um, to be able to do this. But then the sister company that is now delayed on doing their broadband deployment. So a lot of the members of RWA are affiliated with rural broadband companies, you know, fiber companies. So it's, it's, uh, it's having an impact on getting fiber out because you taking that money to pay for this, waiting for this to come through, replace the money that you borrowed from your affiliate. Um, and so that's that's difficult. I mean, not to put words in Carrie's mouth, but all of those you know gap solutions, band aids, they're bad. Yeah, you know, the only solution is to fully fund this from Congress the way it's intended. And to echo what congressional leadership said as we crossed that uh, deadline last month, that the longer that Congress fails to provide this funding, the longer we continue to jeopardize our national security. Yeah, you know, full stop. That this is a national security emergency. The, the bill is passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee by 50 to zero vote. You know, there's broad support. It's time to, to get this on the floor to, to finally get this funded. Is, and is, I will sorry, just, I want to add from an, just to stress the national security issue, that Chinese bal air, balloon that was floating over the United States, if you followed the path of that balloon that was blown up um, off the coast of South Carolina, look how close it came to so many of our military bases where this Huawei and ZTE equipment was installed. So what do you think that balloon was looking at? It followed a very interesting path if you've ever looked at the map and you look at where Huawei and ZTE equipment was installed and in, and the relation to that equipment to military installations. I'm gonna ask kind of final parting words just to come back to John's question about you know potentially what what you know how do you see this panning out you know maybe a year from now you know what's how do you navigate what what's what, what needs to be done i mean i know we talked about you know topping up the fund and making sure that the fund is uh, has enough money for for the replacement process but i mean is there anything else that you can add to this discussion that would make it so that you know carriers are understanding of what they could do potentially um, just opening it up. I, I would just say that the FCC needs to have a, a really serious discussion with the fund administrator about how the fund administrator is going about this. And I'm not saying, you know, loosen up the, you know, but, you know, to the extent that, you know, these rounding errors are throwing monkey wrenches into it, we can come up with some solutions there to make the processing faster. Um, and that has to happen. The fund administrator has to be more fully staffed to handle all of the invoices. Um, and that there has to be some recognition on that. If the FCC doesn't have the funding to pay the fund administrator, then they need Congress to supply that or the FCC needs to budget that. Um, but somehow we've got to move the, the processing along faster. Um, and obviously we need more money to do that as well. And that can come from the $3 billion that that um, Congress is on the issue of processing, really allocate to this. Uh, with respect to processing, one of the biggest issues is that when you have to submit a modification to true up your estimate with the actual, all the time that is spent a couple of weeks now to review that, uh, your whole application is held up it's until frozen. that's completed. And uh, for those who use the cost catalog, virtually every single 
item line item will need a modification. Uh, nothing's going to be exact. And even those who got estimates from uh, vendors, uh, the vast, vast majority of those will need to be modified as well. And so that just creates a huge sort of cycle of, of delay. But I've been on very few panels where there's been so much agreement as this one. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the only way through this is, is through it, right? You, the only way out of this is to complete the removal and replacement of the equipment. And there's just no way that these companies can do it for 40 cents on the dollar. Um, so we, we need uh, action for this to be successful. Um, otherwise, the, the result is a reduction in service in rural America. Again, not only for the subscribers served by these local companies, but, but for all Americans as we travel across the country. Fantastic. Uh, so barring any further questions, um, I'd like to thank the panel for coming out. I mean, this is better than I thought it was going to be. You guys are very knowledgeable. You guys, I've, I mean, I have story ideas right we now. Did you low so... expectations? <laughs> no, 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 I didn't have, no, 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 no. You can't put words in my mouth. <laughs> no, this is good. This is good. Thank you guys so much for coming out and, and for sharing this. I'm sure we have some story ideas now percolating. Um, but uh, hope you all have a great week. Yeah. yeah. I will also note that there's a documentary being made about this as well. So it should come out in about a year and a half. And I hope we're not in the same position that we're in right now when the, the doc, it's been in process for like, I think three years. <laughs> That's cool. So anyway. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you.